and communication librarian at Orcas. And this is my last program. I'm honored to have Jean Helfman here uh, to present this evening. This is an online only program. Uh, we will be recording and posting the program on the library's YouTube channel so that you can look at it again or tell all your friends and those who couldn't make it tonight can see it uh, at their leisure. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to the friends of the library who make our programming possible. And thanks to Holly King, who uh, helped me on the tech side. And thanks again to Jean for attending this evening. We have a few upcoming events I wanted to let you know about. <clears throat> a few recurring events. One is Tech Tuesday. Every Tuesday is at noon. Orcas Online um, generously uh, provides support for an hour once a week for any questions you may have. We have drop-in chess uh, the first and third Sundays of the month at three o'clock. And on the third Sunday of the month, we also have family game night, which has been really fun. Uh, let's see, Orcas Lit Fest is coming up, not this weekend, but the one after. And we are thrilled that Roseanne Perry is going to be speaking. Uh, we have two events with uh, Roseanne. She's the author of A Whale of the Wild, a novel that's been translated into 14 languages and uh, it explores the family bonds of orcas and their survival in a changing seascape. Her book can be found in the library's collection and at Darvel's, and uh, Darvel's will be on hand Saturday for the event. And this is uh, related to um, Jean's work. Uh, let's see, we also have her... <laughs> Uh, there's a writer's workshop with her on June 3rd, and then a family book event on the 4th. And there's more information on our website. Uh, again, that's Friday, June 3rd at 11 for the workshop, and Saturday, June 4th, uh, 11 a.m. for the book event. Uh, both events are, are, for, are free and open to the public. And uh, we also have a cedar basket weaving uh, class for kids on June 15th at 2.30 and 5.30, two sessions, and for adults on June 16th at 5.30. The, we'll have details on the website so you can look at those and sign in. And, <laughs> sorry, someone sent me a message that was really funny and then I realized, oh, that wasn't meant for me. So sorry, can't share. Uh, okay, so now to the main event, I'd like to introduce you to Gene Helfman. Gene is, yes, he's the uh, handsome man with the uh, blue poster behind him. He's an animal behaviorist turned cons conservation biologist with a PhD in ecology from Cornell. Uh, Gene was on the faculty of University of Georgia for 30 years, authoring four books on fish and marine conservation and dozens of related scientific papers. He spent much of his professional career underwater, demonstrating that fish are smarter than conventionally thought. In an effort to get the conservation message to a larger audience and recognizing that more people read fiction than nonfiction, he's written an eco-thriller novel about endangered killer whales called Beyond the Human Realm. And he'll read from that this evening. The novel is currently a finalist for two international book awards, it's available at all of your local bookstores, Darvel's, Lopez Bookshop, Friday Harbor, Griffin Bay, and Anna Cortez. Jean also recently finished publishing or finished writing another eco-thriller horror comedy novel, <laughs> covering a lot of ground, about the reprehensible practice of shark finning. Jean and his wife, Dr. Judy Meyer, an aquatic ecologist, live on Lopez Island. And so with that, I am going to go on mute and let Jean read, and then we'll open up for questions. You can put your questions in the chat box um, as you think of them. So uh, let's, uh, off to you, Jean. Okay, let's see, which screen do I want? Speaker screen, probably. Yeah, yeah, oh, I, I have uh, highlighted you, so everyone should see oh, you okay. as well as anything that's shared. And I will unshare the screen that I have, which is your oh, website. Good. I'm tired of looking at my face, yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you all for, um, for sharing your dinner hour with me. I certainly will not be insulted if anybody um, eats while I'm talking. Um, Carol and I were, were chatting 
just before, and uh, I'm thanking her for staying late. Um, our daughter, Malia, is the uh, program coordinator events management person at the Lopez Library. And, and um, I know that these uh, evenings of extended time cut into, into family life. So um, thank you, Carol and Holly uh, and all of you. Um, uh, your, your, your service is appreciated. Um, so what I, what I would like to do this evening is read the first chapter from, from my novel, um, my eco-thriller love story, um, animal story for adults about the plight of the Southern resident killer whales. Uh, the bo book focuses on the journey of an, a captive male orca released into the wild and the people who are instrumental in his release. And those people, the human characters in the story are an orca researcher, um, his field assistant and a runaway indigenous teenage girl. And together, they work to bring justice to the, uh, to the whales and devise a plan to reverse the decline of the Southern residents. Um, before I start, well, I gotta give you just a little bit of background on how it is I came to write an orca novel. I am by trade, by training, a, a fish behaviorist and a fish conservation ecologist. Uh, but about going on a little more than 30 years ago, uh, when I was a junior faculty member at the University of Georgia and assistant professor, I attended a fish conference uh, in Vancouver at, uh, at UBC. And one evening we got the Vancouver Aquarium for our, our evening social and dinner. We got to sit at tables uh, right amongst the aquarium, basically have dinner with our friends. Um, and um, after dinner, we had a big social and it was one of these noisy affairs with the terrible band playing and people smoking in a crowded room. And so I slipped outside and got to walk around the Vancouver Aquarium. It was a beautiful summer, you know, Vancouver summer night, cool, clear, wandered around, had the place to myself. And I wound up in the uh, amphitheater, the stadium where they had the, uh, the whale show. Uh, I didn't know where I was. I sat down in the bleachers and just kind of enjoyed myself. And then I heard the whale. Um, and it was a male orca, a large male orca with a bent dorsal fin swimming in the pool. And I had never seen an orca before. I certainly knew what they were. I'm a biologist, um, but I was fascinated and I watched it for a while. And then I realized that this whale wasn't swimming in the pool. It was basically pacing. The pool is the size of a couple you know, large backyard pools. And this animal is going around in circles at the exact same speed breathing at the same time in the same place with each circuit. And I realized what I was seeing was a caged animal. Uh, and so my fascination uh, basically turned to a form of depression. Um, it just didn't seem right, but it did spark my interest in, in orcas and I started reading about them. There wasn't a great deal of, of popular literature on the at the time about uh, killer whale biology, but there were some books out there and I started incorporating orca biology in my classes. Now I was teaching in Athens, Georgia, about as far away from any orca as you could possibly be. But when you show pictures of jumping killer whales and videos of, of orcas uh, rubbing their bellies on the beaches up in, in um, British Columbia, even kids from Atlanta start paying attention. And then I got the idea, well, I can't be a whale researcher because I was hired to study fish behavior. Uh, and I had, you know, I was publishing papers and employing people and, and writing grants. And I didn't think the University of Georgia would look very kindly at me if I all of a sudden decided to try to break into a very competitive field and hit a very slow period in production. So I thought, I'll write an orca novel. Um, I'd never written a novel. So I started filling notebooks with thoughts and ideas. And then a series of events occurred that... Um, became elements of the novel. First, Free Willy came out, that's 1993. And that's about a male orca in captivity released into the wild and the effort that involved in that. And then the movie, um, The Cove came out. And The Cove came out in 2009. And for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a, a very, very chilling documentary about this um, town in Japan, Taiji where every year they round up whales and slaughter them to make whale meat. And some of the animals they capture and sell off into the, uh, 
the dolphin slave trade, sent them out to marine parks. Um, ideas from that went into my notebooks. And then Blackfish, the movie Blackfish came out, which is the story of Tilikum, the male whale who was captured in Iceland, I think in 1993 as a juvenile, and then moved from facility to facility, mistreated all his life, basically became a psychopath, killed one trainer down in SeaWorld in, in Florida, and actually killed a couple of other people. But he was basically turned into a stud male orca, uh, producing babies that were then sold off progressively to a number of marine parks. More stuff in my, more notebooks, more stuff in my notebooks. And then finally in 2018, uh, I had retired from the University of Georgia, so I was no longer beholden to do fish research. Um, and uh, Tahlequah, a member of, of JPOD of our Southern residence, J35, carried her dead baby uh, orca around for 17 days, went over a thousand miles, had help from uh, her pod mates. And this became an international news story. Um, everybody uh, felt sympathy. It was pretty obvious. This was her tour of grief with her dead child. And in my notebooks, buried deep, there was something about a dead baby orca. And I realized I've got enough for a novel. And I sat down and I started seriously writing uh, and then finished the book and published it uh, last year, almost to the day. So that, that, that's my journey towards, uh, towards the book. So I would like to read chapter one. Uh, the book begins with um, an epigraph. That's one of those quotes, uh, you know, that stands alone at the, uh, uh, on a page in a book. It, I don't have a preface because I listened to an interview with John Grisham once. And Grisham, whom I absolutely adore as a writer, said, I never write epigraphs. I mean, never write prefaces. Start the book with chapter one. You don't need a preface. So my, my uh, chapter one could probably have been called a preface, but uh, because it does basically set the stage for the rest of the book, but it is chapter one. So the epigraph at the beginning of the book is a quote from Wiley Blanchett's wonderful, wonderful memoir called The Curve of Time about her uh, voyaging with her family on a small boat through the, um, uh, largely through the Gulf Islands in, in British Columbia, but also a little bit down here. And she tosses off, uh, yes, Carol, I think everybody loves that book. I've got it right behind me actually on the shelf. Um, uh, Blanchette just kind of tosses off, uh, I think her kids were saying she should write about some whale, they, a humpback that they encountered. And she says, but who would ever try to write a story about a whale? That went into my notebooks. That was material. And now we have chapter one. Chapter one begins with a quote from Richard Powers' incredible Pulitzer Prize winning novel called The Overstory, um, The Wisdom of the Trees. If you haven't read it, read it. Um, amazing book. But Powers early on says, we're living at a time when claims are being made for a moral authority that lies beyond the human. So I'm going to share my screen here so you can look at something a lot prettier than me. And this is a picture I've managed to take of three J-pod whales in active pass a couple of years ago. My best, my best uh, orca photo. Uh, and you can look at that while, while I read here. <clears throat> Each day was a replica of the one before and the one before that, as far back as he could remember. His routine only changed when they wanted him to perform silly tricks before they would give him food. A split tail got into his pool, how he hated that. She blew a whistle twice, pushed a ball with her nose, then threw the ball to another on the hard land. It was obvious what they wanted him to do. Swimming over, he came up under the ball, carried it across the pool and tossed it to a split tail by the edge. They clearly approved. Someone blew the whistle twice. He ignored it. He'd shown them he understood, but would not perform for them. It was clear this made them unhappy. When they were unhappy, they would skip a feeding. Although hungry, he took pleasure in their frustration. Afterward, one of the split tails, usually a female, would wait until others weren't around and then pour a bucket of food into his pool. He'd lost his freedom so long ago, he had no memory of it having been very young when brought here. He had a vague image of, a, of swimming close to his mother in the open ocean, but then the split tails caught him and brought him to this place, a small oval, smooth, featureless, broken only by a single window. 
a constant swimmer around the oval, over and over, day and night, alone. He did come to like one particular female split tail. She always vocalized softly to him. Did the others think he couldn't hear? Everything about her actions indicated she cared. To reward her, he allowed her, and only her, to ride on his back as a trick. She did this with a four-finned furry animal that he also liked. Maybe it too was a captive. He certainly had no reason to treat that animal badly. His favorite animal did something else special. Late at night, she would come alone, take off the outer skin they always wore, and slip into his pool. She waited for him to swim to her and then would slide up onto his back to be carried around the pool until he sensed she was shaking from the cold. Then he'd swim to the pool's edge and she would get off after giving his back fin a hug. Her company was his only enjoyment. This went on for many moon cycles. Then one night she came with a male. Both of them removed their outer skins and swam with him. But something was wrong about that and he never saw her again. Each day was the same as the one before. Then his life turned around. Another being was lowered into the pool. Her body shape triggered a memory of what his family members looked like. Approaching the new being slowly and scanning it with his sonar, he knew it was a female, a very frightened female. She made sorrowful sounds, terrified sounds. Although he couldn't understand what she was saying, it was obvious she wanted to be left alone. Concluding she was another captive, he backed away, not wanting to cause her more distress. He would do whatever was necessary to make her less frightened and miserable. Having a companion stirred something deep inside, a positive feeling he could barely remember. At first, she wouldn't let him near and never approached him. But slowly, over many weeks, she grew less afraid. To make her comfortable, he always circled the pool ahead of her. Then one day she sped up until she was alongside him and they swam together, together. It was clear that she hated the food they were given. To him, food was food, tasty or not. She felt otherwise and the split tails would poke her with a sharp stick that made her sleepy and then force food down her throat. She often vomited it back. Eventually she ate, it with, she ate what they gave her but without enthusiasm. When they were alone, he showed her the tricks they expected him to perform, mimicking the whistle sound used for each. She caught on immediately and surprised the split tails by performing a trick without being taught. To make things easier for her and cause less trouble, he also began to perform the tricks, anything to win her confidence. Having had no one to talk to, he'd gotten out of the habit, but he wanted desperately to communicate with her so he decided to try to learn her language. To show his willingness, he repeated what she said, knowing his pronunciation was terrible. But she seemed to appreciate his effort and taught him constantly. And they had nothing but time. If only she would talk slower. I'm Nan, what's your name? She said. I am Nan, what's your name? He repeated. No, silly, I am Nan, that's my name. He hesitated, puzzled. He hated to disappoint her, but her meaning was clear from her emphasis. It occurred to him that he had no idea what he called himself. I do not have a name, he finally said, choosing his words carefully. The split tails call me Magai when they want me to do tricks. Nan also hesitated. Finally, she said, well, we don't want them to rule every part of our lives, so I guess I'll have to give you a name. Let's see. I had an uncle named Sam when I was free. He was big and wise and always treated me well. You're big and treat me well. I'm not sure how wise you are, but you remind me of him. So we'll call you Sam. Your name is Sam. Sam, he said, pronouncing it slowly and carefully. Yes, Sam, you are Sam. Okay, my name is Sam. Anything to make her happy. Good, then another thing. In my family, we don't call them split tails. We call them log riders because we always see them riding on logs. Sam wasn't sure what a log was. It didn't matter. Log riders, not split tails, Sam repeated, log riders. Which brings up something else, she said. What do you remember from before they captured you? Not much really, Sam answered. 
I do remember them hurting my mother, her lying still while I cried out to her before they caught me in a, a mesh. I've always assumed they killed her. Wow, I'm really sorry. I guess that makes you an orphan. I hadn't really thought about it that way, but I guess you're right. It was the beginning of my hating the log riders. Sorry. I almost said split tails. Nan performed one trick that Sam never even attempted. In fact, it frightened him. She would jump out of the pool onto the smooth land to excited shouts of the log riders. Then they would push her back into the pool. Just the thought of beaching himself made him shudder, imagining his weight pushing down, crushing him without the water to hold him up. He asked her why she did this. I imagine I'm escaping, she said matter of factly. I know it's a fantasy, but for a brief moment, I'm away from here. Her response hurt his feelings, knowing that she would rather be somewhere else than with him. But she had known freedom while he had been a captive, essentially all his life. Sam did everything he could to make Nan more content. He'd never been so happy, but it was clear she didn't feel the same way. She constantly told him about her family members and what life was like in the open ocean. Nan had one exceptional skill, a rudimentary ability to project a sound image, taking the sonar echo from an object and rebroadcasting it, an ability she said she'd been learning from her uncle Sam. At first, the objects were simple, the toy floats, their food, things in their pool. Even when crudely copied, Sam was able to identify them. As her skill improved, she taught him how to project sound images. He caught on again, slowly. But over time, they would challenge each other, improving their sound images. She especially liked to show Sam her family members, introducing him to each one. Their lives together continued. Then one day, he felt her swimming closer to him, actually rubbing against him, running a side fin along his body. He was surprised at her intimacy and how his body was reacting. Nan didn't seem at all surprised. In fact, she encouraged him. It didn't require much explanation. This became part of their daily routine and a new source of happiness for Sam. Then after a few moon cycles, she stopped encouraging him and in fact, rebuffed his attempts. He was hurt, confused. He finally asked her why. You don't know, she scolded. I have no idea, he answered. Well then, look at me, she said, encouraging him to give her a deep scan. He saw a small body inside her. I I is that what I think it is, he said to her. Yes, she said with obvious pride, we did this. And they waited. Sam gave Nan scanning updates on their child's development. Nan's appetite grew. The log riders must have sensed what was happening. They fed her more and demand, demanded less. Finally, their baby was born, a difficult birth. Nan cried out for her aunts for their assistance. Sam felt helpless, ignorant, frightened. Their baby, a female, was weak at first. Both mother and baby had difficulty nursing. But slowly, things improved and Sam felt a new pride in being a father. The three swam together, although Nan now paid little attention to him. It didn't matter. She was happy, consumed with joy. They named the baby Rosie after Nan's younger sister. And then the un unimaginable happened. The log riders lifted their child from the pool. Rosie cried out for her mother. Nan called to her child and Rosie was gone. Nan stayed by the side of the pool for hours, days, calling for her baby. She refused to eat. Nothing Sam could do or say lessened her grief. She screamed at him to leave her alone. Her condition worsened. Early one morning, Sam found her lying motionless on the bottom of their pool. He was back to being alone. Time passed. Sam returned to being uncooperative, sometimes even aggressive. Then, one day, a new female appeared younger than Nan had been. Sw Sam swam over and spoke to her. The new female cried out, her words unintelligible. It took Sam perhaps 30 seconds to understand. The log, log riders had brought him a new mate. They wanted him to produce babies. He became filled with hatred and anger. The anger rose inside him. It boiled into a blinding, seething rage. He would be no part of this. 
unthinking, he raced across the pool and smashed into not the poolside, but the new female. Yes, he rammed her again and again and again. He bit and thrashed and didn't stop until he knew he had killed her. Not long after, Sam felt the sting of the sleeping stick. When he awoke, he was in an, an entirely different place. They had taken everything from him, his mate, their child. All that was left were his memories and his hatred. Okay. Need to unshare the screen. Somehow. Something like trying to move a cursor around to a little dot. Ah, okay. Um, there we have it. I know it's kind of a downer. Things get better, but it does set the stage for um, pretty much the next 400 pages. Uh, wow. and I, I'd be yeah. delighted to entertain questions um, about anything to do with the book or orcas for that matter. I'm trying to become, if not an authority, at least knowledgeable. Uh, I'll start. I have a question. I had never heard of the ability to project sonic images. Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, Sound there right. are a number of um, implausible facts about orca biology in the book. Uh, and that is one of them. Um, all of them I have taken from other books about orcas by knowledgeable people. And there's a woman up in Canada, Alexandra Mort, who's written several books, one about um, orcas, I think it's called uh, Talking to Whales, uh, in which she, uh, it's a memoir of her own experience up in, in BC, particularly um, up in the um, Discovery Islands and above. And she speculates that whales are able to project images based on watching their behavior. And she actually, in a more recent book, uh, Alexandra Morton is a woman who's been trying to get all the uh, salmon farms out of BC, uh, been working very hard because um, these terrible conditions, these deformed fishes that are covered with parasites and young salmon migrating out of the rivers up in BC go past these fish farms and pick up the parasites and basically are dying off as a result. And uh, Alexandra in her most recent book, which is called Not On My Watch, which is definitely worth reading, uh, again proposes this idea that uh, orcas may be able to take a sound and basically rebroadcast it to um, inform uh, other individuals around her what they have seen. So instead of just talking about what they, it's as if we had the ability to take a, a visual image and then project an image with our eyes. Only uh, a, a whale's world is sound, it's sonar. Uh, and these animals are so highly developed, their sonar is far beyond any capability we as humans have come close to, uh, uh, to per perfecting. Why not? It, it makes for a nice idea. And it comes in importantly in the story. And thank you for asking about that. Sure. I see there are some things in the chat. I haven't looked in the chat. Uh, we have uh, someone who said, Darcy said it's very compelling. And here's one. How can you tell one tell the difference between them projecting an image versus just describing in language what they've seen? Um, <laughs> it's a novel. It's make-believe. I. Um, it's a perfectly good question. Um, why do we show pictures? A picture is worth a thousand words. Um, you know, you give a lecture, you show pictures uh, because you can get an idea across so much better. The details, you know, all the details are there. These are intelligent animals with highly evolved sonar capabilities. If they want to describe something, they describe it with sonar. You've got me on that one. I can't defend it. Good question. Perfectly reasonable. What are the two awards that you've been? Uh, oh, okay. For? All right. Um, the most important one is uh, there's um, an award called the Somerset Literary Fiction Award by a, a commercial reviewing service called Chanticleer. And they run a number of book contests and it's an international award. And there are like five or six stages that you go through what they call it first the slush pile and then the long list and then the short list and then the semifinalist and then finally the finalists. And so it gets pared down. It appears from several hundred books to 
about one or two dozen finalists. And then mid-June, they're going to announce the three winners. I'm very happy to be a finalist. And then there's another reviewing service called Reader's Views that um, also uh, has um, emblazoned me with, uh, with the medallion that allows me to put a finalist sticker on my, uh, on my book. Uh, but again, it goes through review. It starts with a five-star review, and then you move through a series of reviewers until you get to the final stage. So there was, I'm, you know, I'm delighted to have gotten this far. I was delighted when I was a semifinalist. I was delighted when I was in the shortlist um, and, and to, you know, to get winnowed down. Um, the book has gotten a lot of really good reviews. I'm really, I'm really happy with uh, the, the attention it's received because my ultimate goal any, any profits I get from this book, I'm donating to Orca Conservation. I, I would like to educate. I'm an educator uh, by nature. Um, I, I love to teach, much more than doing research, actually. Um, and we've got these animals that deserve to be noticed and cared for and that demand we change our behavior, and I want to get the message across. That's what, that's what the book ultimately, I hope, will do, as well as entertain. Same thing with my shark novel. <laughs> Not had, quite as thrilling a book as, as the Orca book, I have to admit. Have you had any feedback that gives you the impression your book is having the intended effect? I have, when I read the Amazon reviews, which is always a little scary, I've had thing, people say, wow, I never knew this. I want to know more about orcas. Or, you know, this book has made me read more or we really need to do something i will do my part so yeah I, I you know people may just be trying to make me feel good but um but it makes me feel good yes. um any other questions i could read another short chapter if people want i've got a fun chapter i'd like to read uh here's a question what do oh, we well. know about how intelligent orcas are um wow that is the million dollar question. Um, measuring intelligence is very difficult. You know, people say, how, how intelligent would we appear if we had fins instead of fingers? Okay, so uh, it's very difficult. Every intelligent test that has ever been tried on an orca, they've passed with flying colors faster than just about any other animal. Uh, these are captive animals, so, you know, but um, so, their learning capabilities are off the charts. Their brain size relative to their body size is greater than ours. The parts of their brain that are associated with learning and emotion and empathy are much more developed than ours. Everything, so everything about their behavior, their physiology, their social behavior, the way they interact with other orcas, they're, you know, they're incredibly social animals, the way they aid others, um, the way they catch fish and feed others, and not just their young, but the way they cooperate in so many ways. Uh, they, by all measures of, that we like to use for intelligence, they're very intelligent. Um, you can't put an IQ on it, but if you could, uh, they'd be a hell of a lot smarter than me. Uh, and there's a, there's a great deal of research on this. And I, I you know, I, uh, I could I could name the parts of the brain. You know, I've tried to read as much of this as I can. Uh, it it basically, you know, everybody concludes these animals are really smart, and these are hardcore researchers that are doing this. You know, they're 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 not given to uh, emotional um, remonstrations, but they find it hard not to. And and the people, it, it's pretty amazing. So many of these animals, particularly our southern residents, have been captured and put into uh, marine parks, aquaria, and invariably their trainers fall in love with them. Uh, several people who had been paid to capture an orca and deliver it to a marine park let the animal go because they bonded so strongly. They became so empathetic, sympathetic towards the animal, the way the animal responded to them. You know, these were killer whales up until a few decades ago. We feared them. We shot them. The Navy practiced bombing them. Um, up in BC, they set up a machine gun to shoot them when they went by. Uh, fishermen used to shoot them all the time. They get harpoon, and then when we we captured them and started keeping them in captivity, and began to realize 
just what amazing creatures they were and how they weren't out there just to kill everything. Um, it turned around and they came, they, they went from being killer whales to, or, to orcas. Um, although indigenous people call them blackfish and, and actually prefer that name. But every society that lives near them has come to revere them. Uh, and uh, a, a great deal of the novel has to do with uh, indigenous perspectives on orcas and how the orcas have been integrated into their, into their lives and are, are part of their history uh, well beyond mythology. Many, many indigenous cultures um, have the belief that we go back and forth. When we die, we become orcas or orcas become us, or they call them our relatives under the sea. Um, and that all is part of um, the, the, you know, that, that whole emotional intelligent thing. I'm, 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 I'm starting to branch out on this question because there's so much to it, but yeah, uh, there's is the, that. Is the research that we've done only on captive orca or is, has the research also been done on wild orcas? Well, a great deal right here in the San Juan. There are several organizations. This is why we have names for all these animals. And those people, the Center for Whale Research is almost out almost every day following them around. And if you uh, become a member of the Center for Whale Research, you get almost daily bulletins of the interactions. These people have been studying their behavior. Uh, Alexandra Morton knew her animals, knew her, she knew their voices. She knew them that intimately. She put a hydrophone, she knew which one was talking because they have distinctive voices and they've watched their interactions in the wild also. What they can do in an aquarium is a small percentage of what they're capable of out in the wild. Um, and, but that was the start, that was um, our beginnings of, of understanding just, just how smart they are. But the folks who have watched them in the wild are just absolutely amazed at what they do. Every, every day they do amazing new things. Their cooperative hunting is just uh, absolutely amazing. Um, which could lead me into the next, um, oh, I've got here. What kind of research did you do to create your indigenous character? Are you concerned at all about the issues of cultural appropriation as an author? As an aspiring author myself, I've been thinking about this, how to represent characters who are different than myself and from underrepresented groups. Yes, Darcy, that is a critical question. And I struggled with it a lot. Um, I, I am guilty of cultural appropriation. But in doing my research on the biology of, of these animals, it became obvious to me that you couldn't write a valid story about orcas without incorporating the indigenous relationship to them. And so I read a great deal about um, the interactions of, 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 of humans and orcas. And I have had the book read by a person with strong indigenous heritage and that person did not have any problem with what I did. Um, I'm not going to mention the person's name because as always, you know, they say, I don't represent my, my, my tribes that this person is Macaw and Klingit. Um, and other folks that I have spoken with who are very strongly attuned to what's going on with, with the tribes here, um, uh, you know, the First Nations up in Canada and in our native uh, uh, nations here. Um, and I'm not finding a great deal of criticism from anybody but my daughter, who says it's their story, not yours. And she's right. But in the book, I attempt to treat the indigenous characters honestly, accurately, and with respect, um, without stereotyping. Uh, you know, any, any more than is absolutely necessary. Um, read the book and you can tell me whether or not you agree. Thank you for that question. Barbara, can you speak to the concept of culture in orcas, the theory that orcas have culture and it varies from... Oh, that's one of the strongest. Yes, wonderful question. Um, another very good book. I highly recommend Carl Safina's uh, book, Come, Becoming a Wild, came out last year. Uh, it's divided into three parts. The first part is about orcas and sperm whales. The second part is about um, macaws and other parrots. And the third part is about chimpanzees. And each one of them is a long exploration of culture in, in other organisms and defining culture and how we test for it and how we understand it. 
this is a topic near and dear to my heart because many years ago, I um, did a, a field demonstration of cultural transmission in a small fish that lives on a coral reef, grunts how young fish learn from older fish and basically um, um, acquire social information that's, that's non-genetic -gen transmission, which is culture. So there is uh, an amazing amount of research showing that orcas teach their young how to feed, where to feed. Uh, for example, down in Patagonia, there are these orcas that um, run up onto the beach and catch uh, southern fur seals, actually come out of the water. And the folks down there have studied them and they know, uh, they, they, they have watched mothers teach their young how to do this. Um, you know, that's, that's a culturally transmitted practice. And there are many examples in orca, different orcas. So there's like a dozen different maybe species of orcas around the world. We don't know whether to call them species or ecotypes, but they're all different. They eat different things. They have different languages, different dialects, different languages. Um, and they go about catching their young, no, excuse me, their, their, their prey in different ways. And in each one of them, the adults teach the young. And this is passed on from one generation to the next, which is our definition of culture. So there, there, there is no question. And if you, if you get a chance to read Carl Safina's book, he goes in great detail on that topic, both in orcas and also in sperm whales, who uh, transmit um, a great deal of information. They're young and are, are amazing animals now that we're, we're learning about them. Uh, I hope that covers it, Barbara. Good, it's a good question. All right, I'm gonna read in one more. This is a fun, a fun chapter, let me find it. It's much shorter. Um, in, in the book, uh, the book is a love story and a great deal of it has to do with the development of, of a relationship between um, Sam and another whale. But it's also a love story involving humans, uh, the orca researcher and his assistant. And the relationship initially in the story is pretty much just exploitative. Uh, they're, they're both um, uh, together for um, reasons that they haven't really um, made evident, although when you read it, you can tell. But, but their relationship grows as the story goes on. And this was an important, this is an important um, moment in the growth of their relationship. And what makes it fun is that it's true. Uh, a, a, a fellow fish behaviorist, uh, a retired prof up at Simon Fraser uh, University, Larry Dill, had a student who was studying orcas uh, off of, off of uh, Vancouver. And he was studying the residents, the northern residents up there. And he went out with his student one day in their little inflatable boat. And I had borrowed Larry's story. He told it one night at a fish conference over uh, several beers. And, and um, I've taken Larry's story and um, adapted it to the book uh, with Larry's permission. He, he, he likes what I did with it. But it, it shows, among other things, just how intelligent these animals are as much as anything else. So in the chapter, uh, Rudy, the, the researcher, and Cassie, his assistant, and Rudy's canine companion, Cheese Whiz, Cheese for short, uh, leave Bellingham Harbor to go whale watching uh, in, in the little 10 foot long Zodiac boat. So I want you to imagine you're along for the ride um, and recognizing that um, mostly these trips are unsuccessful. Usually when you go out, you don't get to see whales. They motored out of the harbor and headed south. The day was as perfect as could be expected for July, mostly sunny, maybe in the 60s, almost warm, a very light breeze, the water glassy. Rudy said, some whales were seen here yesterday a couple miles south, so maybe they're hanging around, or at least we can hope. They continued slowly south, seeing nothing. Then Cheese, four legs on the bow as usual, gave his signal short bark. He was looking off to the right. At first, Rudy didn't see anything, but then he saw it, a distinctive splash. It clearly wasn't a whale. It splashed again. Something was moving very fast across the surface, right to left, a couple hundred yards away. Then he saw the whales a short distance behind, blowing and swimming fast. Hold on, he shouted and gunned the engine in the direction of the commotion. 
we're in luck, Cassie, he shouted over the engine noise. I think we've got some transient orcas chasing a harbor seal. It was pretty obvious what was happening. A harbor seal was swimming for its life, four orcas in hot pursuit. About a hundred yards away, Rudy cut the engine and drifted. This was too good to be true, or was until the seal saw the boat. It made a sharp left turn and headed right for them. It didn't stop until it ran into the boat with a pronounced bump. Oh shit, Rudy shouted. He knew what was likely to happen. He grabbed an oar, stood up and jabbed at the seal, trying to push it away. The seal dodged the oar and tried to leap into the boat. Rudy jabbed again. The seal bit down on the oar, pulling it out of Rudy's hands and tossed it aside. With minimal effort, the seal leapt into the boat next to Rudy and snapped at him. Rudy scrambled towards the bow. Cassie didn't need to be told to move. Cheese barked once when the seal snapped at Rudy, then seemed to think better of it. And there they sat, Rudy, Cassie, and Cheese crowded together in the bow, as far as possible from the seal in the stern, nine feet away, next to the sputtering outboard motor. What's next, Rudy? Cassie said. Do you think they'll go away? Her voice showed interest, not concern. Maybe, probably not, but I'm pretty sure we're okay. The whales are interested in the seal, not us. Or at least that's what all the books say. Uh, your life vest's nice and tight, right? Just in case. Rudy was contemplating the unpleasant possibility of the whales, all twice the size of the boat, upending them to dislodge the seal like it was on an ice floe. But nothing happened. Instead, the whales moved slowly back and forth about 50 feet behind the boat. The seal watched them. Then the whales started circling. Four large transients led by a male with a very tall dorsal fin. What do you think they're doing? Cassie asked. My guess, and it's only a guess, is that they're assessing the situation and deciding on a course of action. And that might be, she asked. Well, Rudy hesitated. They clearly know the seal is in the boat and they clearly want to eat it. I guess the main question is how to get it out of the boat and into the water. Hopefully just the seal, Cassie offered. Rudy wasn't really worried about being eaten along with the seal. Orcas, whether salmon eating residents or seal eating transients, just didn't eat people. It was one of the ongoing mysteries about these remarkable animals. Still, the, the prospect of being, being dumped in the cold water was less than enticing, and he wasn't sure how the whales would react to cheese. Did dogs have the same immunity as people? Cassie must have read his mind. I don't think we're in danger, but what about cheese? Rudy shrugged. Let's hope we don't find out. All four occupants of the boat swiveled around as the whales continued to circle. They were getting progressively closer to the boat, one following another, the big male still in the lead. Soon they were bumping up against the idling motor as they passed behind, the seal clearly tracking their movement. As the third orca bumped the motor, the seal leaned out and bit it on the dorsal fin. The orcas dove. Oh shit, Rudy whispered. He figured this was going to piss the whales off for real. Now what, would this act of stupidity convince the whales to overturn them? Rudy was fascinated, his scientific curiosity overcoming any fear. He ne never really spent much time watching, watching transient orcas, having focused on their salmon eating resident relatives. A whole new data entry, maybe even a publishable note. The whales remained out of sight. Have they gone away, Cassie asked. She sounded disappointed. I don't know, Rudy answered. But the whales hadn't gone away. About 30 seconds later, they appeared again, circling from a distance, blowing calmly, just like before. All four, one after another in a line, except now the big male was at the end instead of leading. Again, the whales tightened the circle, getting closer to the boat with each circuit. And again, they began bumping up against the motor, just like before. And just like before, the seal leaned over to bite the third whale in the line. But as it did, the fourth whale, the male, leapt up, grabbed the seal's head, and yanked it into the water. What followed was as much a celebration as an attack, as the whale shredded the seal with shakes and tail splashes. At one point, the seal was catapulted high into the air, its limp body turning somersaults before landing. Soon the water around the boat was stained red with seal blood. The last thing Rudy and Cassie saw was the large male orca with the seal in its mouth swimming off 
the other three whales swimming alongside, occasionally leaping from the water and landing sideways, throwing up huge fountains of spray. The three spectators watched silently, fascinated as the whales disappeared. I'll be damned, Rudy finally said aloud. That was fucking fantastic. He turned to Cassie. She had a huge grin on her face. She put her arms around him and whispered in his ear. Yes, fucking fantastic, she repeated. Thank you, Rudy. True story. Another indication just how smart these animals are. So the story is true about the orcas getting the seal out of the boat? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. The only difference that I've made here is that I've moved the male to the back. That uh, other than that, it's exactly what happened. Uh, Larry and his students sat there and watched the whole thing. The seal came up, bumped the boat. He tried to keep the uh, seal out of the boat. The seal jumped in the boat, snapped at him. He and his students sat in the bow. They didn't have a dog with them. And then the orca started circling, circling, circling. The seal bit the third orca. They disappeared, regrouped. You know, you can just imagine the conversation that went on. Do you know what that fucking seal did to me? <laughs> we'll get them. Don't worry. You know, here's what we're going to do. And, and that's what they did. It was, oh, it was there. Goodness. Yeah. Wow. And uh, yeah. So, and these are, these are the, the uh, transients, which are now doing quite well because of the large seal population we have here. Fortunately, re the residents are in decline because of declining uh, salmon populations. So we have the two types right here in our waters, uh, 74 of the, uh, of the residents and, and people are talking about hundreds, 200, 300 of the transient workers um, feeding happily on seals. But there's a question. Oh, okay. Barbara, again, do you have an opinion regarding our local Southern residents eating primarily salmon versus other fish? Seems that is culture. Yes. For example, we eat and don't eat certain things based on our culture. Will the Southern residents shift prey now that salmon are so depleted? Will they shift their culture? Um, the other million dollar question. So our resident orcas prefer Chinook salmon, king salmon, and 90% of their diet is, is Chinook salmon. Uh, Chinook salmon are the most depleted of the five salmon species that we have in our waters, as Barbara well knows. Um, and yet the orcas are starving when there are abundant pink salmon and actually abundant chum salmon, not as abundant coho salmon, um, and certainly sockeye. So why don't they switch? Um, it is a cultural imperative. They have been doing it for so long and through most of their, the orca's evolution, salmon and large Chinook salmon were super abundant. They say um, a, a male orca might have to eat 200 pounds of, of salmon a day to, to maintain. But when you're eating 50 pound salmon, that's four fish. Now a 10 pound salmon uh, is unusual, you know, really large. And somebody catches a 20 pound salmon, it makes the papers, uh, but there aren't many around. So what the thinking is, largely my thinking, is that they are so fixed in their culture that it is just very difficult. They look upon the other salmon as inedible um, and they would rather starve than switch. It doesn't seem intelligent, but, you know, it worked for so long. They're not the only animals that do this. And when you think about it, think about pandas. Um, they eat bamboo. Bamboo is disappearing in China. One of the reasons that, that pandas are declining, aside from all the, uh, the artificial propagation that's going on, uh, but they were declining because the bamboo forests were disappearing. And they only eat a few kinds of bamboo, although there are many dozen of kind. It may be that their digestive tract is such they can't handle many of the other kinds of bamboo. Um, koala uh, feed specifically on eucalyptus and a certain kind of eucalyptus or a few kinds. Australia is chock full of different species of eucalyptus and yet the koalas find it difficult to switch. It could be a dietary physiological thing or it could be a cultural thing, but it's not unheard of. So, so the, the answer not knowing any better is that they are so fixed in their ways that they find it very difficult to, to change. One would think an intelligent animal could change. Um, you know, think of a five-year-old who only eats um, um, 
cheese. Oh, I'm, <laughs> what's a terrible cheese dish that all five year olds love? Somebody help me. Macaroni and cheese. That's there it. There you go. Yeah. We have a nephew who could only eat macaroni and cheese and pizza. Would he eat nothing? Actually, I think he still only eats macaroni and, and cheese and pizza, although he can make spaghetti now. Um, you know, and and kids will starve rather than than eat what we, we tried to give them. I would like to think they could change. I'm looking at the time. We're coming up two minutes yeah. to seven. Susan, I'm not going to keep you much longer. Um, Susan Slapen sent me a note. She said, your topic is poignant. Congratulations on your work. She has a different question. She uh, does what you do sometimes. She closes her eyes to focus on her thoughts. Uh, while she's talking um, and it's an interesting way our minds work and she wonders if you have thoughts about that uh probably a bad habit if you're speaking in public um uh and you're right when you close your eyes it's almost like you can see the words um but uh i will try to maintain eye contact for the rest of the hour and <laughs> only be a minute right <laughs> That's right. Yeah, thank you so much, Jean. This was really compelling, and I'm hopeful it has the impact that you're you're going for. You know, I've I've been to a few presentations on fish farms, and um, and I and I remember the what was it when we had the volcano, Mount St. Helens, and they were like, oh no, the salmon won't come back you know they had all these farms on the rivers and the salmon came back you know when we left nature alone she did just fine thank you and um so i wonder if uh what kind of um effect or impact we're having on the fish farming um well <laughs> the uh governor inslee uh signed legislation basically outlawing uh fish farms in the state um it's being fought uh you know we had that tremendous collapse over on cyprus when you know people don't 200,000 atlantic salmon were released into the wild and um fortunately most of them starved to death because they didn't know how to feed on anything other than pellets but some have seen been seen going up rivers and spawning um and this has created a problem up in bc where uh, escaped fish are interfering with the breeding of native fish in addition to this issue of, of parasite transmission uh, and also uh, antibiotic uh, resistance. Um, fish farms are a terrible thing. And if you read Alexander Morton's book, you would never ever think of eating farm salmon, you know, um, farm fresh salmon, Atlantic salmon. All you see is fillets, but the pictures of these fish in these pens, they're deformed, they're covered in parasite, they're covered in lesions from fighting with one another. Uh, they would never ever serve one of these up whole because no one would ever think of eating it. But when you fillet it, you have no idea what it looked like when it was live. Uh, the mortality is incredibly high. Uh, there, I have, I give a talk called Fish versus Fisheries. And in it, I go into a long diatribe on 12 reasons why you should never eat farm-raised salmon. Uh, and, and every one of them is a good reason, but 12 of them uh, is a compelling argument. Um, you know, eat wild caught salmon. We need to support our salmon fishermen. Although I myself will not fish for Chinook salmon in these waters because any fish I catch is taken out of the mouth of an orca. Um, I've had this conversation with some people. I'm not going to win this battle, but I think more and more people are, are coming around. Uh, and, you know, I hope the book can do something. Uh, I appreciate everybody's time. Um, save the whales, do everything you can. Stay away from them in your boat. Um, and if anybody's in a book club and would like uh, would like to, you know, play with this book and critique it, I, I really enjoy doing book clubs because getting to talk to people who have read the book and want to um, question me on why I put this where and what right do I have to say this and et cetera, et cetera. That, you know, that's, that's one thing an author can really, really get into. Uh, my wife is tired of talking to me about the book. And <laughs> me talking to her about the book. So I, I thank you, Carol. Thanks a lot for setting this up. Holly, thank you very much. Everybody go eat dinner. Thank you, Jean. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.